Hey everyone, welcome to News with the Nerds, your weekly source for nerdy news headlines here on the Nerd Network. Uh, I am the Jake the Nerd. I am here with our good friend the John the Nerd. And one more, how are you guys doing tonight? Oh, doing well, thanks. Doing good. Awesome. And in this show, we bring you a selection of nerdy headlines in our first segment. We touch on each of them and talk about their world impact. And then we take a short break and we deep dive into a larger subject. That subject today being the apparent consternation between the largest country on earth and the largest ego on earth, China versus uh, Tony Stark, or Elon Musk, I'm sorry. <laughs> so all that aside, uh, today we're going to talk about some weird and wacky crap. Um, some digitally recreated Stan Lee, some Lego sets, and and space news. So first coming to us is one more with uh, his headline of the week. What do you got, boss? Uh, yeah, so um, Lego just released a pre-order for the dro- uh, the BD-1 droid from Star Wars Jedi The Fallen <laughs> Order. Um, what's interesting about this one, it is the first time Lego has taken a Star Wars IP from something other than the movies and TV shows. In this case, it's a video game. Um, it's item 75335. It's $99.99. Um, it's got a 1,062 pieces. Um, the head of the droid can be tilted back, forward, and sideways, which is pretty cool. Um, I've, I've actually got a, uh, a you know, well, not that droid, but um, you know, they do a really good job creating oh, this articulation. It's JJ Abrams' bot. Yeah, you know, yeah, and um, yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, this is actually discontinued, and uh, I got one of the last ones. I was really happy about it. Nice. Um, but the, the thing that I really love about what they're doing with these more adult Legos is they're releasing these with these little placards, which have like a little stat card mm-hmm. and a miniature version of the uh, of the overall toy. Oh, and this cool. new one comes with that as well. And uh, we'll, we'll probably put a picture up here so you guys can see what that looks like. Um, also... Uh, Eshazor, or Jay Simmons from our Star Trek reviews and our Obi-Wan Kenobi reviews is going to be doing a Let's Build for the channel. Once yes. that comes out, he's already pre-ordered it. Oh, sweet. Is That's he also awesome. doing Optimus? Uh, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> uh, I haven't. Uh, that hasn't shown up for pre-order yet, but I will be getting both. This, um, this time's well because uh, BD-1 has seen in uh, the trailer for the new sequel to Jedi Fallen Order that just dropped a few days ago as well. I also oh, saw I one of them in uh, Book of Boba Fett. Yeah, oh, that's right, that's right, yes. Oh, that was a fun, that was a, yeah. a fun, fun yeah, little I, Easter egg. I think that the new, the second game is called Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Yes. Um, I would, I would not be surprised it. if somebody comes up with a light kit for this new droid, because oh. in, in the game, the back of his head has a light panel on it that conveys his emotions, and mm-hmm. I would Aww. not be surprised if a light kit comes out so that, that you get you can add that to your droid. Yeah. I uh, this droid is adorable. Have you you guys played the game? A little bit. I have, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a ton of fun. It's like Dark Souls meets Star Wars, but it's still a ton of fun. Um, the character is great. He was actually a fan favorite for the one to appear at the end of Mandalorian Season 2. If you haven't seen that, and spoiler alert, it's Luke, which is arguably better, but Cal Kestis, who owns this droid, um, is the main character for those stories, and this is kind of like his R2-D2 sidekick. Uh, it's a really neat character and a really awesome companion. That story, I believe, picks up right after Order 66 is executed, right? Uh, it's so mm-hmm. Cal is like a small child during that. Yeah. And he's a teenager during the game. So it's probably gotcha. about 10. Matter of fact, probably about the same time frame as the Obi Wan Kenobi show. <laughs> Throwing it out there, Disney. Um, <laughs> I thought he, I thought he was. After the Obi Wan Kenobi of... show takes place 10 years after Order 66. It's is correct. Executed. Yeah. And he is, he's late single digits when uh, Order 66 happens. And he's either late teens or early 20s. So it's close to that time frame. Hmm. And 
we go to the Fortress Inquisitorius in the Obi Wan trailer that, that is in the end of the game. Um, something else that's kind of interesting that. is that this particular droid looks very similar to a droid that follows, oddly enough, a similar character through Titanfall, um, uh, the Titanfall huh. 2 game. And um, it, uh, it was made, it was created by the same artist. Yeah, I am consistently amazed at what Lego can do with their product. Oh, it's big time. just fantastic. From obviously well, yeah, I mean, last just, week to you. Just this right. guy. This guy was thirty dollars. And look at the really? level. Yeah, and look at the wow, level of articulation like and yeah. This is pretty sizable. Yeah, I mean the the other one's gonna be something like sixteen inches tall. You know, so you know. The other one that puts it <laughs> that puts it at life size, which means you're gonna start seeing a whole bunch of cosplayers showing up at conventions. Oh yeah, with their BD ones on the shoulder because that yeah. through the game BD one uh, hangs out on the shoulder. He's a backpack. Yeah. So fun fact: in the Battlefront Two game missions, the character in that Iden Verso has a backpack droid. It's a black like anger droid. So they're very opposite versions of each other. But so I, I hope I know I know we're almost done with this segment, but I hope that the droid unveiled in the Obi One episode one and two, um, the one that Leia has. Oh yes, I would Lola. love to see. I would yeah. love to see Lego do Lola. I, I need Lola. Would be really cute. It's like a paperweight. <laughs> <laughs> well, John. Time to move on to our second piece tonight. I heard you got some space news. Yeah, we do have quite a bit of space news this week. Uh, a lot of space. Well, there is. There is. Uh, it, it goes around uh, with quite a few different items. Uh, first off, uh, ast astronomers have discovered a hidden trove of, of massive black holes. Um, he said actually enough that some of these astronomers got kind of nervous when they started seeing uh, what they were finding. But a team of researchers... Uh, at uh, UNC Chapel Hill Department of Physics and Astronomy found a previously overlooked treasure trove of massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. This, uh, this new discovery uh, kind of gives us a glimpse into the life story of a supermassive black hole like the one that is, is, uh, is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So um, quite an interesting uh, new way to learn more about how our galaxy formed and how we got to the point we're at now and where we're going, um, going forward on that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm kind of, it's, this is one of those things that I think I'm going to be kind of following a little bit because uh, I was pretty, pretty impressed with some of the information that I saw on there. Um, Why were they nervous? When you when you're looking up into the sky and you start seeing lots of black holes, very big, super super massive black holes that you hadn't noticed previously, it's a bit disconcerting. I could see that being a bit of a concern. They're, they they have a, a gravitational effect on a massive amount of space around them. Yes. So it's very possible that a black a newly formed black hole, right, or maybe even one we didn't know before may throw off our gravitational projections you know the mm -hmm. mathematics and all that kind of stuff about you know things like space travel and stuff like that ha mm -hmm. have a major impact on that kind of stuff interestingly yeah. the james webb telescope one of its missions is to look at the primordial black holes these are the ones that um, were basically formed at the, during the you know the big bang um mm -hmm. they, they were formed almost immediately um, and uh, it may give us some more indications about the origins of our universe. That would be pretty cool. And, you know, funny you should mention the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, but uh, that was another part of our news this week uh, as, we uh, as we move along into our, into our next bit of space news. Um, the, uh, uh, the observatory successfully watched a moving asteroid as the telescope inched closer to the end of a six-month commissioning period. So they were trying uh, a practice run to see if it could track an object um, for distance, for, for time. Uh, one of the big things with, with, the, uh, with the telescope, obviously, is being able to see further into the cosmos than we ever have before and being able to see better, clearer pictures of everything. 
making sure at the kind of distance that it has to be at in order to be able to, to, to perform these functions for us, they want to make sure that it's going to do what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so that's that's something that uh, that has come up. They uh, they successfully managed to track an asteroid, and um, uh, let's see, it was the uh, exercise was called the six eight four one Tenzing, a main belt asteroid named after Tingzen Tingzen Tenzing Norgay, uh, the Tibetan mountaineer who was one of the first uh, to uh, summit Mount Everest. And uh, so they, uh, they had a choice of about 40 different asteroids to test uh, the moving target tracking with. And that's the one they, they picked. Uh, with a name so linked to success as invoking um, the, the name of, of somebody who had done so much with, with mountain climbing, I, they, seemed, uh, they felt that it was kind of a no-brainer to use for their first test. And it, uh, it went successfully well. I mean, just just spectacularly well. It did exactly what they were hoping to. And uh, um, they're on and off to better things with this, uh, with this space telescope and, and seeing what they, can, what they can come up with. And not to be outdone, even though it's been around a long time, um, we had new, new news this week um, from the Hubble Space Telescope as well. Uh, Hubble uh, has been hard at work for more than three decades, uh, as we know, and it's created such a vast archive of data that it will, I mean, at this point, of course, most of the major, major things, major discoveries have, have been poured over already, but there's so much to still go through. Uh, NASA officials termed in a statement that they found a river of star formation. Uh, this uh, takes place at the intersection of four dwarf galaxies within the Hicks, uh, Hickson Compact Group of galaxies. Now, the image was first released in 2010, but now that they're going back and being able to, to, to re-examine the footage and, and learn a little bit more about what they're finding, uh, they were finding uh, some additional additional data and additional uh, learning on how these these stars are moving um, literally from from one point to another, uh, where, they're, where they're actually seeing like this this river effect of these uh, of these star formations. So very interesting that you know not only uh, a device that's been up there for thirty years, but one that took these pictures. Uh, now 12 years ago, and they're still learning new new facts mm -hmm. from it. <clears throat> Space is vast, and as yes, Elon Musk says, it's also hard. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, if if you follow our Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and please do if you if you haven't already, uh, it, it's always trying to kill us, according to this. <laughs> always. All right. Well, thank you, John. Absolutely. For our third headline this week, we had some news out of the superhero community. Uh, it was noted that 14 months before Stanley died, he had taped five cameos in upcoming Marvel Studios products. Well, about a week ago, Wired reports that news broke that Marvel has signed a 20-year deal with Stanley Entertainment. That's the entertainment company that controls his name appearance. Uh, voice, likeness, and signature across content, basically all content and media, uh, for a 20-year deal to exclusively control his likeness in media. Um, I think this is incredibly important, um, not just for Stan Lee, but for um, original IP in general. Mm. Because we've seen them do a, a younger version of Leia. We've seen them do old Tarkin. Uh, we've seen them recreate a number of other characters. They tried to make a James Dean movie with a digital James Dean. Um, this, other than being to Stan Lee, to have more cameos, which is Stan Lee's thing, which we know he loved to do. 
I think it skirts dangerously close to the line of once we have actors in iconic roles, we're going to have Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones forever. We're going to have James Earl Jones as the voice of Darth Vader forever. We're going to have, you know, William Shatner back as Captain Kirk in season 72 of Strange New World. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have Captain Picard on Star Trek The Next Next Generation. It's, I think this is a very slippery slope to get very out of hand with the technology the way it's developing. I maybe in the future um, that technology is not good enough yet. Um, I think to be convincing. I mean, yeah, I mean, a good, a good example is is Leia, right? The 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 CGI they did of Leia, she looked really plasticky um, and and stuff like that. And well, you it's, can it's tell, gotten better, arguably. Yeah, oh, well, it has. It has. Well, remember I mean, that was six years ago. Sure. Have you watched the Book of Boba Fett? Yeah. The Luke, um, yeah, he's still, technology. yeah, yeah. What, what's interesting about Luke is is that they, mm-hmm. the, the folks who CGI'd him for the end of The Mandalorian, mm-hmm. um, a, a person using deep fake did yep. a better version than they did. We, and they we actually, actually brought that up, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yes, <laughs> um, it, it, it can be done, it, it's not easy, um, and not only that, but they. While they can do the the video, the audio mm-hmm. is actually still pretty hard. Um, you know, so replicating those voices, you know, I mean, granted, they've cases. got in, in many cases they've got sampling of their voices going back. Well, <laughs> and, you know, then you bring in somebody like Ross Marquand, who did he played the Red Skull in Infinity War and Endgame. It was not Hugo Weaving. So all you need is the likeness, then you get somebody who's an impressionist, impression artist. Right. Mm-hmm. Then you so might there, as well have that other actor. So there are a couple of things to this. First off, um, and, and I completely and totally agree. Um, do we know for a fact it was, was this more of an assumption that that's what Marvel is planning to do? Or is it just that they want to secure the rights to his likeness, signature, and that kind of thing? Because if they're just doing that to lock down a part of marvel that they don't want to lose i could totally see it yeah and, and i hope that's what oh. it is i mean if you think about it, all the documentaries all of the things that he, all the interviews and stuff that he's done you know they they now have the ability with this with this agreement to go and grab all of that and insert it into other stuff. Marvel has um, lost so but... many of their properties they don't want to risk losing a property so they specifically say um, to use his name, voice, likeness, and signature across a wide range of applications, including but not limited to films, TV shows, theme parks, merchandise, and undefined experiences. So they're going to make a Stanley animatronic. <laughs> well, Stanley, I see it coming now. Stanley <laughs> is Marvel. You don't yeah. have oh, you don't have Marvel without Stanley. So I think 100%. I think this is a good thing. The, the article that we're referencing puts a really negative spin on this. Um, and, you know, clearly Stan Lee wanted to be part of just the films in general, right? I mean, he, he pre-recorded a bunch in case he died, right? And then we had, yeah. and, and sure enough, after he passed away, we had five, right, pre-recorded left over. Um, so if they CGI him into future films and stuff like that, I'm all for it. Because that, that, so, that's just part of the experience. I, I, I'm opinion, not sure that they would even do that. I think they, they just move. want to keep it as part of the family. Right. And not Which is risk fair. losing it. Now, and there are some cases, if I can interject real fast, sure. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be interrupting you, Jake. There are some cases where this is something <laughs> that somebody actually did want. And it's very possible that Stan Lee said, hey, if there's a way you can do this, I'm all for it. Um, back Prior to passing her passing away, um, Majel Barrett Roddenberry, the the uh, the, the wife of, of of Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, she had played the voice of the Enterprise computer, um, starting with the beginning of Next Generation, and occasionally in the original series, but most of the time it was a different voice. But starting with Next Generation on through. A little on DS9, not as much. Voyager, absolutely. 
Um, she was the voice. In fact, even in the 2009 Star Trek movie, they had her come on when she was not in, in good health whatsoever. And they had her record the lines. During that time when her health was starting to falter, uh, they had a group who came in at her wish uh, to record not text, not speech, or anything like that, but base phonics mm -hmm. so that later a computer could put together something that would sound like her, even if it if it wasn't a word that she had ever had had ever said before or had recorded. Right. The legacy so is that important, case, that's was important she, to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the legacy was important. She and felt she had done this and she wanted to continue. Mm -hmm. well, and I suspect, Lee, so... I suspect a, a similar conversation happened with Stan Lee and his family. Right. And if that's, well, and there's two paths of that. If he had that conversation with Marvel and said, do this and continue that journey because it's right. appropriate and it's what the fans know, yada, yada, that's fine. But if his family, from all intents and, and reports, was not great to him, so if it's them saying if that's different to me, if my opinion, the money out of it, yeah. My opinion is please don't CGI him in. Do like the Deadpool movies did, and have a poster for a billboard or something like that. Honor him. Don't exploit him. Right. So. And if it means that by having his likeness, they can put a picture of him in the in the crawl in the in the stinger that that marvel puts at the beginning of their their movies mm -hmm. then i am absolutely all for it that and the signature i mean if you remember at the end of of endgame right every everyone did their signatures mm -hmm. um you know on, on their photos as the credits rolled i would love to see them do that for stanley i agree so that is our third headline we're going to go and take a break and we'll be right back with our main subject which is war in space apparently <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of News with the Nerds. Today, our deep dive topic is an episode of Space Invaders. Uh, Eco Musk versus the great Chinese nation. One more is going to take us through this. It's just kind of a mess. Right. So, so first, I want to preface this that this is... Uh... An, an article from Newsweek, so a fairly reputable source, but it is a reportedly type of story. So this is this, you know, so they uh, they don't take have it all with a grain of salt. In. But the topic itself is worth talking about. So uh, reportedly, a team of Chinese researchers published a study calling for anti-satellite capabilities that specifically could disable Elon Musk Starlink satellites if it was deemed necessary. Now, for those who don't know, the Starlink satellites provide internet across the world, and there's thousands of them up. They're really small, right? So any weapon system that might be developed to do this would need to be able to take out many very small targets. So we're, we're not talking missiles in space here. We're probably talking something more like radio waves, lasers, some other type of offensive disabling technology. Uh, we're not looking to explode things here, I don't think. Um, but what, what, what's really concerning here, you know, Starlink technically is an American company, um, and the United States has had some increased tensions with some of the foreign powers, such as China and Russia and, and – uh, you know, and as those tensions continue to tighten and rise and whatnot, situations like this could become more common, right? So, mm -hmm. um, well, especially with a, a a company that has actually done some military work. Yes, which yeah, so, so, Starlink yeah, so has the, done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, right. They they've actually improved the speed of the internet connection of like our fighter jets while they're in motion. Um, and Russia is kind of pissed off about it because Elon Musk's company provided free internet access to the Ukrainians so that they could have live information um, on the regular, even if other infrastructure got taken down. So this is, uh, you know, so, you know, Starlink, I think in general is a really good thing. Um, 
but there are many countries in this world who don't believe that the free exchange of ideas and information should be a thing. And China and Russia are two of those countries. (laughs) To be fair, there is such a thing as too much exchange of certain ideas and information. But that should be up to the individual to decide. It is. Yeah. So, but but the point the the point is is the the purpose of Starlink was to provide internet access to very rural countries that didn't have it, right? Because the infrastructure just isn't there. Well, now all you got to do with your computer or cell phone or whatever, have a little, little antenna, and you have access to the internet because it connects to these satellites. And they've done mm-hmm. it at a fairly inexpensive rate. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So, And it's not bad internet. It's actually really fast compared to, like, Dish Network's version of the internet, right? Right. Um, <laughs> well, and, and it's going to be significantly more robust because instead of it being several large satellites in orbit, it's You're talking about swarms ones. of thousands of small ones. Right. So if now, one goes dead, eh, no big deal. This hasn't, you know, gone without its own controversies. Um, you know, they, they have had, you know, some other satellites have had to reposition themselves to avoid colliding with these things. But that could be said of the other thousands of pieces of space junk that are up there right now. Oh, too. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's not just Hubble, the ISS, and whatever else. It's yeah. Years and decades and decades of rockets and junk and debris right. and right. So, you know, so fifty one launches. Right. So the <laughs> internet international law dictates that we are not allowed to weaponize space. <laughs> if China does this, it breaks international law. Um, for further reading, check out the TV show for all mankind. Yeah. <laughs> so this becomes a huge issue is what with it, weaponizing it space because when one nation weaponizes space the rest of them are going to do it because it, it you know it's it, it's a war of attrition right mm-hmm. what so, is the word there's a process it's a it's a tipping point when you bust up one thing in space and the ricochet effect after you bust up a certain number of things that the debris fields will just completely wipe the slate of everything in space Hmm. It's, a, know it's, what a, about. Is, but it's an exponential about. effect. Well, yeah, so basically as, figured, as, as one thing breaks, that breaks something else, and it just gets bigger and bigger. It right. Fuel, it's basically right? a wave of just destruction. Right. Um, and well, eventually those orbits decay and they burn up yeah. in the atmosphere. Well, yeah, but um, by then, you know, it's done. Well, so right. So, right. So, if China, well, again, we're not necessarily talking about destroying these satellites it may just be disabling them Hmm. right so so they they you know you know these satellites are intended to be replaced over time as they decay and fall into you know the thing you know every every launch they do they deploy a few hundred of these small satellites off of a single launch uh if you ever get a chance go look for a video on it it's really cool what it looks like when they deploy these small satellites yeah well, and also we've had at least one or two situations where the deployment did not function properly, and they ended up self-destructing them. And <laughs> so you saw people seeing these streaks coming down through the sky um, that almost looked like a meteor shower, but it was these Starlink devices burning up on reentry because the, uh, the the launch hadn't been as successful as they wanted it to be, and they couldn't get them to the right orbit. Yeah, so... Uh, so in addition to China, and we, we talked about Russia, but uh, earlier this month, Dmitry Rogozin, uh, head of the uh, Russia's uh, space agency, apparently sent a threat to Elon Musk after the uh, mm. th- technology was supplied to Ukraine. Um, according to an English translator, um, he said that Musk was involved in supplying Ukraine with military communication equipment and that he would be held accountable like an adult um <laughs> i'm sure there was something lost in the translation there but um he said, I count you like adults. i'm not certain of that at all i think they Get i think the that was meant CPA. just that way <laughs> yeah um so you know uh, clearly you know i think i think this technology in general has um, major implications beyond the military that upset oh, these, these major powers um, but yeah, the military application. But here's the thing, 
Elon Musk is not beholden to the United States. He's yeah. a global. Yep. He owns a global company. So if China wanted to tap into this for their use, he would be free to negotiate those contracts so long as it didn't conflict with his contracts with the U.S. military. Um, so, you know, and I know there's some dicey area there, but you know, it's it's not like you know other countries can't take advantage of this technology. Um, it, it doesn't have a specific military application, except that it can be used for military applications. If that makes any sense. No, it does. Um, yeah. So. Um, I read though that the amount of satellites that are going into the air with this, mm-hmm. they're creating so much background light that it's becoming harder and harder for things like the Event Horizon Telescope Array. Um, the telescope arrays in Hawaii that are usually used to look at deep space because of the lack of light pollution, mm-hmm. it's getting harder for them to see. And their long exposure lenses, they're ending up with streaks across the lens because well, it's I had more, not heard more, that. more likely wow. that they'll come across. I, I think, though, with the commercialization of space, that that was inevitable. Unfortunately. Um, but, yep. but here's the thing. We've already got two tested telescopes that we put in space, and with our internet technology including maybe the use of Starlink, we can have these telescopes communicate through an internet relay down and we can have no atmospheric interference or light pollution. You know, yep. that, that was the whole thing with James Webb. It put this giant um, uh, sail behind it that blocked the light from the sun in its entirety. Um, yep. That allows, you know, allows it to you know, reach the, the corners of our universe. So I think that's pretty cool. So anyway, that that's it for this topic. Um, you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> there really isn't anything all, folks. else to talk about here, unless you guys had anything to add. No, I think it's something to definitely keep an eye on. Yeah, and, definitely. And and see where yeah. it's going to go, but uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on yeah. Tony Stark versus the Crimson Dynamo. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> If, if Elon Musk wasn't so fond of his pretty face, you know, maybe an Iron Man suits in the future, you know. <laughs> he can get a transparent helmet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did see how beat up Tony Stark's face got a few times, so. Well, and he got cooked at the end, so. Yep, yep. So. <laughs> Anyways, well, folks, that has been this week's episode of Mews with the Nerds. We hope you've enjoyed and been informed, sort of. Uh, come on back next week for select nerdy headlines and a deepish dive into one topic here from me and John and John One Vore. Um, one Vore, where can they find you, sir? Uh, yeah, so um, we're at uh, Dork Forge. You can find us on all the social media platforms, and we have an online store on Etsy, which will have a link with a 10% coupon code below. Um, we sell all kinds of nerdy stuff and have some new Father's Day things up. Um, so we're adding new items all the time. So, you know, if you don't see something you like today, check back in a week. It'll probably, it might be there. Um, <laughs> and I am being told by my wife, who is a marketing manager, that I need to create a, my own, uh, social media presence. So I will be looking into doing that here before too long and <laughs> hopefully filling it with some content. Uh, don't hold your breath. So, <laughs> so we've got one for at TBD and at Dork Forge. <laughs> I am the Jake the Nerd on Twitter and Instagram. He is the John the Nerd on Twitter. If you want to find our Facebook, it's at the Nerd Network. You can't throw vowels at it, throw that at symbol in front. And if you're here, you're enjoying our content, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. It helps to boost our numbers and defeat you know, the algorithm uh, to help get a larger audience to make more and better content for you to enjoy. Yep. Uh, but that's all from us. This has been News with the Nerds. Have a great evening. Have a good evening. Be be safe. Hey, thanks for watching this video here on the Nerd Network. John, what can they look forward to from the network? So be sure to check out News with the Nerds. Uh, First up, this is going to be our new weekly news show. It recaps select nerdy headlines from the previous week. And this generally is going to air on Mondays at 7 p.m. Next up, what you want to look for is every month uh, near the beginning of the month, I host a show called From the John's Vault, where I take a classic uh, cult classic or other famous movie from the 70s, 80s, or 90s that I love and is dear to me in one way or the other that Jake has never seen before. 
so it's uh, quite a fun time uh, with the two of us comparing and contrasting notes based on, on uh, the, the age that we are now. Uh, coming soon, we also have a very interesting and special limited series uh, that deals with mental health, diving into some of our favorite pop culture characters, uh, such as Seven of Nine from Star Trek and, and the Joker and, and others. This is going to be airing on Wednesdays over the summer. As I said, it's a limited run series that I think you'll get quite a bit out of. Uh, finally, be sure, of course, as always, to be here for episodes of uh, Nerd Talk on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays as we dive into episodic reviews of each of the shows that we're getting into right now. Uh, we've got uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and quite a few others. Uh, these are shows that we know you love, we do too, and characters that we enjoy and we, we want to dive into and, and learn a little bit more about. All right, and to just make sure that you hear about all the things that we are putting out there for you, make sure you hit that subscribe button, ring that bell so you get notified every time content drops so you can enjoy everything with us as we talk nerdy stuff with all of our folks. Uh, thank you for choosing the Nerd Network. Have a great evening and be safe.